hello. I'd like to welcome everybody. Okay, welcome everybody to the first meeting of the Transportation, Mobility, and Infrastructure Commission. Uh, my name is Jason McCoy. I am going to be your secretary for this commission. Uh, opposite me uh, is Jennifer Schmidt. She will be the secretary for the commission. I'd like to recognize in the crowd Denix Ambia, who is the uh, public works director for the city of West Sacramento. And to my left is David Tilley with the community development department. Uh, this being the first meeting, usually the meeting is uh, run by a chairman and uh, uh, a committee. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start this off with a Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm going to ask everybody to rise, face the flag, and we'll say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now I'd like to go ahead and ask Jennifer Schmidt to swear in the new commissioners. Um, if you can just all put your, you can stand up if you want, <laughs> but you can st stay there. Just raise your right hand and repeat after me. And then when I you say I and then your name, I'd like to go each of you and say your name. So your oath of allegiance is I. Again, Jim Joe. Do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I will take this obligation freely Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. That's it. Congratulations, commissioners, and welcome to the official first meeting. Uh, I'd like to have you each go ahead and, since this is the first meeting, provide uh, the viewers with an introduction of yourselves. Uh, that way we can get to know uh, your background a little bit. Uh, if you could keep it just a little bit brief so we can keep the meeting going, but uh, if uh, you could start out at the end there, I'd appreciate it. Hi, my name is Scott Gelbke. I'm an insurance agent. I have my own agency. It's a farmer's insurance agency in uh, Natomas. Hi, Kyle Glenkler. I'm a project manager for a general engineering and construction firm uh, in Roseville. I've lived in West Sacramento for, since 2006. Uh, glad to be here. Hi, I'm Steve Peterson. I'm a resident of West Sacramento for 12 years. I'm a local realtor and I also work for a private realtor in the city of West Sacramento. Hi, I'm Jennifer Schmidt. I'm the Joshua Good evening, everyone. My name is Thomas Vu. I've lived here in uh, West Sac since January of 2007. I work for a uh, statewide trade association. My name is Amy Tanner. I'm a legislative analyst for the state of California and have been a resident of West Sacramento for two years. Hi, everyone. Uh, my official name is Yan Zhou, but 
the yan the yan part is sounds like a yawn, so that's why I I changed my to them to my nickname, Joni, and so everybody know me by Joni. <laughs> I'm an economics professor at Sacramento State, and my field of interest include international economics and economic development. So um, I've been on the EDAC for four years, and I've lived in West Sac for almost seven years. All right, thank you, everyone. I'd like to uh, go ahead and move on to item 1C, and that would be the election of uh, commission chair and vice chair. I think we're gonna start out with uh, election of the chairman for the commission. Uh, I would like to point out uh, that uh, Amy is our, Amy Tanner is our alternate commissioner. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot be uh, a chair uh, for the commission, but um, uh, at this time you can vote uh, as an alternate. Uh, so, uh, moving into that, uh, let's go ahead and, and take this back to the commission uh, for discussion. Well, um, it seems to me that uh, Joni, um, having been on the EDAC, I think, have others been on the EDAC? Kyle also. Kyle also? Okay. T to me, it seems the most, to make the most sense to maybe start off there. I don't know. That makes sense to others. Sure, I'd be happy to serve. Likewise, happy to serve. I've uh, been on the EDAC before that, the Parks and Community Services Commission. Oh, okay. Um, you all want to thumb wrestle? Or <laughs> 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 if I could, um, at this time, uh, probably the most uh, thing to do would be to um, make a motion, uh, and then the commission will be uh, actually either if we hear a second uh, for any nomination uh, then the commission will vote on that nomination for the chairman and then uh, we will uh, officially move on from there well i move for uh, mr glanker to be uh, chair uh, second it okay hearing a motion and a second uh, will you please take roll call jennifer First, I wanted to see who um, seconded Steve. Steve. Okay. okay, roll call. Scott Gelke. Here. Kyle Glankler. Here. Steve Peterson. Aye. Joshua Stark. Here. Thomas Vu. Here. Uh, if I may, uh, we're looking for a yes or a no oh, on this. Oh, roll call. And, uh, a yes or a no. Yay or a or a nay. To, to ensure uh, we had a quorum. I'm sorry. If, if you could, Jennifer. Oh, we want a unanimous vote is what we want, <laughs> if it's unanimous. Okay, so um, how do you vote Scott Gelke on chair for Kyle Glankler? Yes. <laughs> yes. Kyle Glankler. I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Steve Peterson. Aye. Joshua Stark. Aye. Thomas Vu. Aye. Amy Tanner. Yes. And Joni. Aye. Yeah, I guess in the future okay. we could just say all, all those in favor, <laughs> say aye. <laughs> okay, that's a unanimous vote, except for the abstain. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to ask. Uh, Mr. Blankler to take the center position uh, on the dais, and then uh, we will go ahead and uh, vote uh, for um, vice chair. And again, like to hear a uh, nomination or uh, a motion and a second, and then uh, we'll just continue on. If we uh, choose to, uh, we can follow uh, Joni's uh, re uh, recommendation that we hear a uh, all in favor. Second. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? All those in favor? Can I? Okay, all those in favor of Joni as our vice chair? Aye. 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 Any, uh, any, okay, any discussion? Abstained or not. Motion passes. Great, thank you. 
Uh, just a quick comment. Thank you. I'm very honored to serve as the first chair of this commission. It's an exciting commission and uh, a lot of great things happening here in West Sacramento. So I look forward to working with all you guys and girls. <laughs> okay. So uh, if we could, I'm sorry, once again, do uh, the change of, of chairs so that uh, we have the chair and vice chair uh, in the center. That uh, is typically how we do it. And then from that point, uh, we are going to pass this over to uh, you, Mr. Glankler, as the chairman of the commission. Jimmy, did you want to say anything or are you ready to move on? Okay. Uh, so with that, we're going to move on to the second item on the agenda. Uh, which is the uh, report on the future meetings of the Transportation, Mobility, and Infrastructure Commission. Uh, so I believe it's just up to us to adopt the resolution, or uh, at this point we open it up for discussion if there's need for discussion on the alternative meeting time. I, I, I would just like, like to confirm the dates again. Sure. Um, they're listed. The third page. I'm missing. <laughs> Thank you. So today, obviously, April 8th, um, Monday, May 4th, Monday, July 6th, September 14th, which I, I don't believe is a Monday. It is a Monday, a special meeting on the 14th of September, and November 2nd would round out the dates for 2015. Any further discussion on that? Um, if not, I'll entertain a motion. I move. Okay. First and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any discussion? Great motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item and agenda number three, which is a presentation of the draft mobility element of the general plan of 2035. Yes, uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is David Tilley. I'm the principal planner in the city's community development department and I'm also the project manager for what we call General Plan 2035. Uh, General Plan 2035 is our comprehensive General Plan update program uh, that has been going on for just a little bit, just a little while now, um, uh, with a few fits and starts, but we're trying now to move toward the finish line um, this year. And so part of our overall efforts is we're bringing the various policy elements um, through the commission structure and ultimately to council um, this is one we did bring to the former EDAC um, last fall, um, but given that we have this new commission structure now and, and a commission that's much more focused on mobility issues, uh, we're pl pleased to bring this back to this new commission tonight um, as one of your first items. Um, since policy, transportation policy matters is most definitely um, your core um, function and purpose, as I understand, your new commission. So we have we're done a lot of work on the general plan update uh, over the last several years, and I've sort of summarized some of the major major events in the you know, in the background section of your staff report, um, and I'm happy to go into any of that in more detail if any of the commissioners um, are are interested. Uh, but I would like to focus on on L, one policy element of our general plan tonight, and of course that's the mobility element. Uh, mobility element is sort of the the ter new term term of art um, these days for what has always historically been known as the circulation element in a general plan. And circulation element generally lays out your goals and policies from a circulation standpoint in your community and historically has been focused primarily on uh, vehicular matters. Um, in this era, um, especially since the passage of um, SB 375 back in 2008, um, it's really moved much more, much more broadly into more of the notion of complete streets. Uh, and so our general plan mobility element has been crafted in a way to reflect that all forms of mobility and all modes are equally important and need to be accommodated um, with, within our general plan. Uh, we also, there also was another significant bill that was passed, um, SB 743, most people sort of know it as the King's Arena Bill, um, but it did a lot of other things um, that are very important to us and even though some of that is still percolating through um, the Office of Planning and Research and ultimately through the Office of Administrative Law, it's, it is something that is out there that we need to be, work, be working on and that specifically is how is um, 
traditional level of service policy that's always been in the general plan going to be treated in this era when level of service uh, will no longer be considered a, a threshold of impact under the California Environmental Quality Act going forward. Um, everything is moving in a much more into a vehicle miles traveled direction, which from a staff standpoint, we actually think is favorable, uh, will be favorable to us, and it actually brings CEQA back to focusing on really what its true intention was, which is impacts on the physical environment. So attached to your staff report tonight, we have the draft uh, mobility element. Um, as I said before, we did bring this to the former REDAC. Um, we have been to Planning Commission, and we actually have been to Council, so we're doing things a little bit out of the, a little bit out of the order. Um, but since we have your new commission, I want to present this now. So I'll try to summarize some of the major themes within the commission that I'd very much like to get your input and we'll take public comment um, to the extent we have any this evening as well. So as it, we lead off with our mobility element, it does dress as, you know, a multimodal nature. Um, this, is, this is something that we've long strived for and have done well with in our community, um, but we really need to establish um, those as formal policy objectives in our general plan. And by multimodal, I mean that mo various modes of transportation, not just cars, but bikes, pedestrians, transit, goods movement, rail, are all accommodated and given um, equal consideration. So we have numerous goals and, and policy objectives on how we're going to achieve and, and maintain the multimodal system that we already have. Um, the second goal is also very important. This is part of, you know, in the post SB 375 areas, the notion of complete streets. Uh, we need to make sure that streets um, in our community you know, serve all modes and are, and are constructed and reconstructed in a manner that provides for um, pedestrian, bicycling, and mass transit op options and are not just strictly for cars. Um, so we move forward. Uh, we, want, we do obviously have a roadway network that we need to maintain and we, need, we wish that to continue to function and operate as best as possible. And so we have numerous goals and objectives that do address the more traditional things you would find in the circulation element regarding level of service. And we're going to want to remain focused on some of those when we get to our next item as we start to apply some of these a little more into the real world. Um, as always, we'll have a circulation diagram that describes sort of our overall roadway network. Um, this, will, this will be very similar to what we have now in that mo much of our roadway network with limited exceptions actually already exists. Uh, we are not looking for, you know, with one very notable ex exception, you know, the roadway network that you see out there today um, is largely what we will have, you know, in the future. Um, even though we all know we're working on two new bridges over the Sacramento River, uh, but, you know, by certainly, for the most part, most roads already exist. And so what we need to be working and focusing on is how do we get the most out of those, those the existing roadway network. Um, and moving into the fourth goal, this addresses transit. This is a big policy issue and, and has a long time been in our community. Um, we invest most of our TDA money back into our transit operations. As many of the, you know, your commissioners may know, we're actively working with our regional partners on a streetcar system uh, that we hope to have operational within the next, you know, few years. And so, we want to maintain our objectives on transit as we have been doing and hopefully even improve upon that. And as part of the multimodal nature, we want to make sure that um, bicycle and, and pedestrian facilities are accommodated, not just accommodated, but provided for as an active means of transportation. Um, this is also an important objective because it overlaps with some of our other policy objectives under healthy communities. We want to make sure that these are facilities that are available not just for people that are, you know, commuting, but they're also readily available for recreational and other uses, um, as those have some accomplished some other objectives. And of course, any bike and walking and pedestrian also leads back also to some of our greenhouse gas reduction ob objectives that are in our climate action plan. So part of the overall general plan needs to be internally consistent. And so even though we're sort of looking at the mobility element here, sort of a bit in a vacuum. Um, you know, you can see how some of these matters um, can overlap into other areas and help reinforce other objectives that we have in the community. Um, in goal M M7, this is a very important area as we start getting into parking. As the city begins to, de you know, grow and urbanize in many areas, parking is, is becoming much more and more of a, of a resource that needs more day-to-day -day active management. 
um, you know, the days of just building sort of an on-site parking lot, you know, sort of calling it good, or those are days in many parts of our community are starting to go away. Uh, we need to be managing parking. We need to be looking at it from a, as a resource standpoint, an economic standpoint, you know, in terms of pricing, congestion pricing, um, providing for various other types of vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, shared parking, uh, unbundled, everything that you would looking for in a more urbanizing community is some things we want to make sure we're accommodating. And then lastly but not leastly, we want to be into um, recognizing that we have a lot of large employers in our community. Um, transportation demand management remain a very important objective for us. Um, any trips that we can reduce um, through through especially through large employers our, our benefit our overall network uh, but also we recommend that our our community maintains a very large industrial base and goods movement is also remains very important to us both from a transportation standpoint but also from an economic development standpoint so um, our our community is is definitely diversifying although it's remaining some of its historical character and we need to be able to accommodate all of those things as we move into our future as we're looking out to 2035. So um, with that sort of concludes over over introduction of the overarching goals um, in the mobility element, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have and I would also ask that you take any public comment such that we have it this evening. Thank you very much for your report. Um, I'd like to start off with a couple of questions. I, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, you mentioned the bridges and somewhat of a, a focus of the federal government on West Sacramento as uh, a um, possible recipient of some funding for these bridges. And uh, I just wanted to know if there was some discussion going to this plan or at the council meeting about access to our health care institutions that are across the river and how, how that might play into this general plan. Well, um, we want to increase accessibility and permeability um, just overall. Um, you know, we see the river as something that should unite us, not divide us, you know, from Sacramento. Um, so that's why, you know, big reason why we have you know two major bridge projects underway um, that you know Jason is working on and uh, we you know, we completed the McGowan bridge uh, that's why we're doing the streetcar it's all about connectivity and so be it to healthcare facilities elsewhere or any other amenities or desirable functions you know, we're significantly underbridged uh, compared to other comparable communities um, if you look at the Portland or the Cincinnati's of the world you take the one obligatory shot of in the, on TV when they show the baseball stadium you can see five or six bridges you know in the background in one shot and you know, you can, we don't even have five bridges total here so that's part of our overall effort here is to improve connectivity and the bridges are a big part of that second follow-up question uh, related to parking is there uh, I see the, the groundwork for it late here is there a, a, an idea or um, a movement towards identifying a parking master plan for the city for the at least for the downtown area or yeah we the re, the old redevelopment agency did one years ago that sort of laid out some of the basic you know fundamentals and I know that we've been working with Sacramento um, of late on potential doing some parking management has there been in the parking business for a long time I think it's inevitable that we will need to be in the park much more in the parking business um, than we ever have been before um, in our urbanizing areas we've already you know starting to have you know a lot of parking on street spaces that have time limits on them those are all done by design to try to encourage you know turnover and movement um, but we're also in these early years in the um, some of the housing that's being built in the bridge district near Rayleigh Field is allowing some of those parking you know those projects to utilize some of that parking on street for the residents in the early years um, well because we know there won't be a lot of on street demand from other users but also we're not to the point where we'll be building parking garages you know just yet either so we will, we will be definitely getting more and more involved in the parking management and the community center and community college across the street is sort of the, a little laboratory over there of how uh, parking management you know, we need to be in because you have to look at time spaces and spaces for different users, but then trying to get the most out of spaces. You know, it's not the same as a big suburban you know, parking lot anymore in our, in our downtown area. And that will only increase over time. Thank you. Um, just yeah. to comment on that, um, it, it's also a, an interesting little laboratory that that parking structure around the library and the, the community college center um, for the uh, improving the efficiency of, of multimodal options for people arriving and leaving. Um, and 
because that it has a, a you know a good transit stop right next to it, um, but it doesn't have a very robust, for example, a bicycle pathway, um, and there are problems uh, in access for say persons with disabilities and things like that on the streets immediately surrounding it. The facility itself is is really well designed and, and beautiful too, um, but the the roads and streets that immediate are immediately adjacent or within a quarter mile. Um, often have high speed limits, have long waits for pedestrian crossings and things like that. And that, that will also impact parking. Yeah, I have a comment and a couple questions. Uh, I, uh, just as a resident, I just wanted to note that uh, some of the demographics uh, of our community are that we have an increasing youth and, and senior population here. So I think it's really an important thrust of the, the mobility element to emphasize multimodal forms of transportation, obviously transit, bikes and pedestrians, as well as uh, cars. So I, I like the fact that this is really forward thinking in terms of our demographics of the community. Um, I had a couple questions. One is uh, the connectivity uh, policy, uh, which is M1.1. Uh, and then you have something related to that, which is eliminate gaps, which is M1.9. Has the city identified uh, or mapped where the gaps in the circulation system are within the city, whether there are missing uh, bike connections or uh, street connections where, you know, as you go through the community, it's well acknowledged here that there's, there's a lot of barriers yes. uh, for the cyclists as well as others. And I'm just curious, uh, do we have any information on where those gaps exist? Uh, the bike tread and pe the bike trails and pedestrian master plan um, did a lot of that, you know, work. Um, I think the recent Sycamore Trail project was a good example of you know closing a large gap in our community. Uh, we haven't necessarily gone around you know and surveyed you know sort of every you know part in detail. That'll probably be an implementation measure here, so we can prior you know identify all those gaps and prioritize them. Um, sort of how I see it playing out. Uh, but it, it is most something we definitely need to get a better handle on because you know, it's it's not entirely easy getting around town even though right. some places are not that far apart. I mean, yeah. Some obstructions we have are going you know, to be difficult to overcome like freeways and, and rail lines, but we can definitely do, improve on where we are now. Yeah, I, I may suggest then a, a slight word change on M-1.9 where it says the city shall strive uh, to eliminate roadway uh, and other gaps. Maybe we can uh, uh, phrase that to say the city shall identify or strive to identify and eliminate because I think the first step is the identification of where those gaps exist and then some kind of a program to you know address those, whether it's a capital project or other means. Um, and then, you know, whether it's a map or something. Related to that is uh, whether the city has any authority to, uh, through private entitlement review, uh, require, let's say, a subdivision where there is a gap that exists to establish some kind of an easement or a link between a development so that so a gap is basically addressed not only through a capital project like a bridge or some other thing the city might fund, but also through our review of uh, development projects where we, could, we have the, the authority in the policy document or through some ordinance to uh, effectively implement uh, uh, some kind of a connecting element, whether it's an easement or a roadway or, or a bike, bike trail. Uh, uh, I've had a little bit of experience with that, and I think there's got to be a foundation somewhere in here to allow that to happen. And um, I, that's maybe a little farther down in the implementation uh, phase, but I think it would be important to at least uh, have some policy basis to do that. So no, I don't know what you think about that, but I, I just wanted to throw that out as. Well, I think that's, you actually raise a good point. I mean, in practice, we generally, you know, try to do that. Um, but I like, I like to think that the general plan probably should make reference to you know, new development projects, helping solve some of those gap right. issues when they have adjacent, when they're adjacent. I mean, you have to have the nexus, but um, in many cases, the nexus is right, right out, literally at the front door. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Or? Yeah, quick. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> quick question. Um, I know our port saw some good news for the first time in a long time when that cement barge came in with uh, with a large shipment. Um, and I know the desire to deepen the um, the channel has 
the dredge the channel has been there for a long time uh, I know it's been difficult to to get you know, to get that going you know where is that in the process right now to deepen that that channel and what you know what's been holding that up yeah there there isn't any direct effort on that right now a few years ago we were working on that with the core it's a pretty it's a pretty massive you know project because most people, you know, they see the ship channel here. They, you know, but it goes like 12 miles, I believe, you know, down down the channel. So it's a very lengthy endeavor uh, to do it. And <coughs> most of that funding would come from the federal government. And the last, you know, kind of big effort we we're going at there, part of those requirements is a really a cost benefit analysis. And unfortunately, that wasn't coming out entirely favorably to be able to get the funding. It is most definitely something we would still want to do and we will still try to do um, but there's no right there's nothing imminent that's for sure uh, yes I have a, a couple of questions um, first of all I, I want to say I'm generally really pleased especially with the first report uh, talking about uh, or the the way that staff addressed the 743 and LOS that was really nice to see coming onto a brand new commission and kind of being new to the commission level of stuff coming from the advocacy world um, we did quite a bit of work on 743 um, uh, a number of friends did as well um, my question uh, with regards to the document is with with uh, m1.4 first of all around public outreach and the the uh, desire for um, appropriate public outreach um, what what were your thoughts on the general efficacy of public outreach? Like, what what was the turnout over time? Well, admittedly, we have not had um, throngs of people come to a lot of our you know general plan workshops and other things. And we have every time we do one, we try certain try to try some different strategies, you know, try to reach you know some folks. Um, as you know, I, I think as you you know, if you were at the um, Monday board and commission um, meeting. You know, the mayor kind of touched on this point, I think, you know, rather well, is that, you know, you, you're not going to get a ton of people, you know, no matter what you do. Um, but we, we, fortunately, nowadays, we're able to communicate out so much better than we have in the past, you know, through iLights and then the Facebook page and the website. Even if people aren't coming to a meeting physically like this, you know, the information is out there. And so, but every time, we always try new strategies to try to reach additional, additional people. And I created a Facebook group just for the general plan update, you know, when we were going in earnest last time, sort of as an experiment. And I actually got quite a few folks that joined more than would ever be, ever been at some of our meetings. So, um, you know, fortunately, we don't have a large, you know, public audience here tonight. But, you know, at least the meeting is being broadcast. If people see it, they'll see the agendas. And we can deal, talk with them offline. Uh, but we, we always need to strive to do better in this because, you know, it, in a city of 50,000 plus, we ought to get a few more than what we're getting I mean, typically. Yeah, and, and every community is unique in, in the way in, in which its, its public reaches out. Um, there's also kind of a, a, a flip side to outreach as well, which is participation, right? Uh, it's one thing to get the word out. It's another to, you know, to have robust participation, um, and I appreciate that. I, I, I um, would recommend that maybe you um, review the different methods that you used and identify those methods which were most effective and, and try to try to uh, encourage their use in, in future endeavors um, also there's a in, in the, the advocacy world that within the safe routes to schools programs they have kind of um, flipped public participation on its head where they have walk audits and these things don't happen unless there are people showing up so it encourages um, you know a lot more uh, direct outreach so there are there are some methods out there um, that can be effective, possibly for here as well. Um, but it was an honest question; it wasn't rhetorical. I, I was just curious as to what your thoughts were on it. Um, I do have another um, question or a, a comment with regards to uh, M two point thirteen, um, just recommending that you add language that includes people with disabilities. Um, it mentions that the city shall uh, endeavor to ensure that bicycle, pedestrian, and public transit facilities are constructed to minimize conflicts among bicyclists, pedestrians, transit operators, users, and motorists. And I, I think uh, it might be a good idea to include uh, individuals with disabilities to address the accessibility issues. Um, and then um, last with section M2.4, 
3.10, uh, tr with regards to traffic calming, the city shall support the installation of traffic calming features on streets with high pedestrian traffic and along neighborhood streets. Um, it kind of creates a chicken and egg issue. Um, streets that have trouble or problems associated with speed um, are not usually streets with high pedestrian traffic because of the speed um, or on any number of other factors. So identifying those that, um, that may become high pedestrian, uh, ha increase pedestrian use um, and therefore reduce VMT uh, are, are places you know, where, where we could reach out. Any further comments from the commission? I believe you. I just have a, a last question. Uh, the circulation uh, diagram itself, is that something that exists or is that something that we can be provided with? Yeah, it's something I can provide to the commission. Um, it will look substantially similar to what we have in our current general plan. I apologize, I don't have it in front of you um, here tonight. I'm still actually putting together an actual you know, good exhibit now. Uh, but if you try to, you can sort of visualize our you know, city road network with a couple more, bri couple more bridges, you, know, you pretty much have it. Okay, thanks. I believe there was a request to ask if there was public comment. Is that still the case? I will certainly always inc invite to public comment to the extent there is any. Seeing that, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you very much for report some great comments and look forward to hearing more about this in the future. We we'll move forward on to item number four on the agenda, which is the present the draft findings of the traffic analysis prepared for general plan 2035. Yes, I'm going to start this um, item off um, before we hand it over to uh, Mr. Long, or our, our consultant from DKS and Associates. Um, as we we built a new model for our for our city general you know, traffic uses, um, with John and you know being in the lead in that. Um, so the current model we have is just you know woefully behind the times, and it just there's no other way to say it like that. So uh, after they completed building the new models, part of their part of our work for a general plan is they run the model on our t general plan 2035 land use scenario, and this is sort of the, the preliminary work that will ultimately feed into the general plan environmental impact report. And so they we presented thus far the preliminary results of. That analysis, and you know, for, for again, this is at 2035. Now we have to think, of, imagine a city with maybe 80,000 people in it and substantially more employment in 2035. Um, and so, not not surprisingly, we have identified you know some problem areas um, from a traffic standpoint. Um, many of which are ones that you might sort of expect because there's some of them are you know pretty kind of tight in peak hours you know in, in present day. And so I've listed many of those, you know, in your staff report, you know, such as Jefferson, Kegel at Sacramento Avenue, um, Jefferson, 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 um, various intersections, um, Harbor and Industrial, you know, Fifth and Tower Bridge Gateway. And these are areas right now where we already experience, you know, various levels of congestion. Uh, but in particular, I want to talk about Lake pa Lake Washington and Southport Parkway. Uh, this was the one that sort of, you know, stood out to us the most. Um, in terms of what levels of congestion we might expect there in the future, uh, you know, we, kn we knew it would, you know, it would definitely pick up, but we were sort of su surprised at how significantly it could. Uh, that intersection, um, which is over near the near the Lowe's, you know, shopping center in Southport, um, definitely experiences a lot of AM traffic, and you know, you know, both directions, and then thus PM traffic in both directions. Residential people going to jobs, people coming into Southport for jobs. And so it's it's one where you know it's busy both ways, you know, AM and PM. So, and part of John's work, and he's going to elaborate on this, and some of these other various intersections around town, um, they identified some potential improvements. You know, and many of these improvements are, you know, you know, some restriping, some new lanes, you know, turn lanes, a lot of fairly typical type improvements. Um, but the Southport Parkway and Lake Washington intersection was one that was would probably need a much more substantial improvement and um, the, the initial thought um, would actually be to have to grade separate that intersection which would be kind of would be a very significant project in and of itself um, and in our estimation um, may not work well with bikes pedestrians transit you know as well and so 
in our goal down in this new era of sort of complete streets and trying to think of all modes at once, um, you know, we want to go over that intersection, some of these other improvements, and then see what maybe some other options out there we might to not have to maybe do something that way that significant, and then also other upstream improvements, you know, in that corridor that may be necessary. So um, the main one of the main objectives of this report tonight, we're in seeking a formal recommendation from the commission is going to be regarding the Enterprise Boulevard Bridge. Um, this bridge has been in our circulation element, um, you know, since the original general plan was done, um, but it hadn't really been thought of, you know, something that would likely would be feasible in, you know, in the real world. So typically in transportation analysis, you know, we would not include that bridge or assume that that bridge would be in place, you know, even by the horizon year. Well, the work that we've identified thus far, you know, with John's um, efforts with us, says that you know the enterprise bridge is something that you know what we may need to start now taking more seriously um, in your staff report uh, let's see uh, and attach let's see I mean, we put an exhibit in there I'm sorry it's uh, what the attachments here I apologize aren't um, aren't labeled uh, but there's I put a we put a map in there um, it's an aerial map here a couple pages into your attachments that shows sort of a general rendering of where that bridge could be particularly since we have um, what's called an IOD in the Southport Business Park for it. Um, this bridge will cross the ship channel and extend, essentially, connect Enterprise Boulevard, you know, into Southport and vice versa. Um, this is a this is a something that again we have looked at before. Even back in 1997, we got the right of way for it on the south side of the channel. The anticipation of doing this, and really what we want to now consider, and after we hear from John's report, is we circle back is uh, we would like we would seek the commission's recommendation to the city council that uh, we actually begin planning for this bridge formally um, so that um, and it's not something we need to build today tomorrow or next week but by our horizon year 2035 if we grow the way we expect to grow um, we expect to need this bridge and that it could offer significant benefits um, to us um, from many standpoints so with that, unless you have any questions for me at this time, I'd like to ask John to come up and he has a more formal presentation um, for you on much more of the details. I think we have one question, Commissioner Peterson. Yeah, I think this is for David. Uh, I was looking at your diagram, um, the, uh, I guess it's called the base case. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is why wasn't, uh, uh, roughly 3rd and C Street, which is where the I Street bridge crossing is, starts. Why wasn't that modeled? Because, uh, my, of course, my personal experience living in Metro Place right next to that facility is that there are significant backup problems currently with the current bridge configuration, and I understand we're, we're doing a, a realignment or a, a new bridge in that location, but I'm just curious why it, it doesn't seem to be in any of the modeling of the intersection work. And, that's one of the obvious locations I see a lot of congestion today. Yeah, well, that will be, John will be able to go over Except that. for John? That's okay. fine. Um, Well, what I, my job is to really do an analysis of what the uh, general plan um, through 2035 would look like. And um, yes, it is a multimodal plan, and, and our, our work is really to capture all the multimodal aspects of it. We will be talking primarily about traffic tonight, but I will also be mentioning a lot of things that are related to the other aspects of uh, the other modes of transportation. Um, we are looking at 2035, which is not full build out of the city. Um, the city has worked, David has worked very hard with SACOG to be consistent with the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which is being updated right now. Um, they'll be coming out with a, uh, a draft and an uh, environmental document in the fall and looking for uh, the um, uh, adoption of a new uh, 
Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy uh, about a year from now in February of 2016. So there's been a real effort to try to stay consistent with that, both from a land use standpoint and a transportation improvement standpoint, which is one of the key reasons why we have, it's good that we could be ahead of the game as much as possible to identify transportation improvements that are needed to make sure that we can get those into the, the MTPSES. Um, as David mentioned, uh, we have a new travel demand model uh, for the city. This is really what it is, it's, it's taking the um, SACOG's SACSIM model, which is a state-of-the-art model that really gets at the heart of land use and transportation mixes and how, how they interact. Uh, it's a parcel-based model, which means it's looking at interactions down to a very fine level of detail. It really gets at the issues of density and, and uh, um, mixes of uses at a fine grain level so that you can really capture uh, whether people really will walk or bike and, and walk to transit and uh, uh, reduce you know, their vehicle travel because of those uh, land use uh, uh, you know, mixes and in, in densities. And so what we did is we took that and we, we made a much more fine grained version of it for the city so that uh, we can capture um, all your street travel, all your bike lanes and so forth in, in the city. And so we spent a bunch of time trying to get that in a, as detailed fashion as we could and then to validate that model for against transit ridership and uh, traffic forecasts and data that we have for the city for the last couple of years. Um, the, uh, the thing we're going to be talking about tonight is a little bit more on the roadway focus. And the roadway focus is really on the major streets that you have, the arterial and collector streets in your uh, functional classification system on your circulation diagram, which you'll be looking at probably soon. Um, This uh, second diagram here is, uh, uh, it just shows you a, a generalized version of uh, the uh, uh, daily traffic volumes that exist today on your roadway system. To give you an idea of the type of volumes we're talking about, some of the highest volumes, uh, Harbor Boulevard near uh, uh, US 50, 40,000 cars a day. Um, Jefferson, just south of US 50, about 35,000 cars a day. You could stays at 30, over 30,000 cars on Jefferson to south of the Ship Canal. Um, you have major volumes up on Reed, and uh, you can see that, you know, where the major flows are. And this was uh, counted before uh, South River Road was extended across the uh, Ship Canal. So, you know, that were the graphics you'll see tonight show that as a future roadway even though it now exists because it wasn't in the counts and database that we had. Okay. I don't really see the colors on this. Um, what we um, we show on this slide is uh, the projected 2012 through 2035 growth. It's summarized at a real course level. It's just really households and employment um, looking at the yellow colors, we can see them on there, are the uh, uh, households and the purple colors, which you don't really see on that diagram, are the uh, um, employment, so the ones to, to the right. The two right columns are the to the out of the employment. And um, I'm sorry, John, can I interrupt? I just want to make sure that the commissioners can see the colors on their screen. Can you? Yes, we can okay. see it. We can see them on our screen as okay, well. I, I think just it's can't just see them on there. Okay. Right. Good. You have to do it by Good. memory. I, I've got this. I, can, I, I don't have to see them on there. I, suppose make, I didn't know that you could see them. Okay, so the purple colors on there are employment. The yellow colors on there are households. We just divided this up into north of Ship Cadell versus south, Southport. Uh, you can see that uh, in north of uh, 
uh, the northern portion of the city, basically a doubling of, of uh, the number of residential units, uh, almost doubling of, of employment. Uh, in Southport, we're talking about going from about 7,700 to 12,400 in households and uh, going from 2,700 to 12,700 in employment. Now these are things that have been worked out between the city planning department and SACOG as the overall kind of growth estimates through the year 2035. This is not built out of the city. But it, you're seeing it right on here is just big numbers, but really this is, there was a lot of effort went into how much of this is going to be in the bridge district, how much is gonna be in, in various portions and mixes of land uses and so forth. So again, we're modeling this at a very fine level of detail. Um, so this, this diagram is showing the assumed roadway network improvements that are our starting point, our baseline for um, our analysis. This is what has been in the Metropolitan Transportation SES uh, uh, is, is what has been in there since 2012. And it shows um, in colors where the widening going, uh, orange means you're widening the four lanes, purple means you're widening the six lanes, and then you'll see a bunch of dots on there, which are intersection improvements. Um, the dash lines are, are uh, new roadway facilities, such as the Village Parkway being extended to the south. It does show the new crossing uh, across uh, at South River Road, which now already exists. It shows the new river crossings at Broadway and at uh, uh, C Street um, on, on this uh, as the assumed uh, roadway improvements would be for 2035. Um, this is our starting point because this is what was in the MTP SES. Um, what we're, our job is to look at this and see how well does it function uh, and then to make some recommendations to the city as to how they might want to change that. Um, the dots on the maps are assumed intersection improvements. These are things that are not specifically in the MTP SES. These are things that we have evaluated and made some preliminary recommendations to city staff about some turn lanes that could be added at very intersect various intersections. Most of these, I think, are, are we think are, are feasible. We think that adding a, another left turn lane or a right turn lane in a certain location, we've looked at it and said it's probably feasible. The, I think city staff is still looking at those, and so this might be fine-tuned, but where you see these dots on there, they're assumed in the analysis that we're gonna be showing you because we think that they're reasonable and feasible. There are a few locations we didn't put dots on the mats because we know that they're not, they're, there's very challenging locations and so you'll see some level service issues that uh, reflect that. So this diagram um, is a another uh, the wider the bandwidth on this, the, the, the higher the volume. This is a projection of 2035 uh, uh, demand under that baseline condition. It's a little hard to kind of tell from this, so I'd like to switch to this one right here, which is the next diagram. This really talks about growth. It's a little bit easier to understand this than to try to read you know, these lines, even if I put numbers on This This is showing uh, in, going from orange, which is smaller increases, up to red, which are larger increases, that are uh, increases in, in, in volumes on uh, the various roadways. The blue lines on there are new roadways. So the red and orange represent growth, where blue, it's 100% because there isn't anything there today. So that's why we colored it blue, just to say that's 100% growth. Um, to give you an idea of some of the types of uh, volumes that we're forecasting um, on industrial uh, just north of the ship canal we're talking about a growth of over 20,000 cars a day on Southport where it meets uh, Lake Washington we're talking about a growth of about 18 almost 19,000 cars a day um, 
you'll see that Jefferson is, is, doesn't seem as fat. Well, it's because it's actually fairly congested and it's just not assumed to be improved on its northern end. It's increasing by uh, uh, less than 10,000 cars a day, some portions of it, but that's because it's, con it's a constrained roadway. Um, on the other hand, South River Road is increasing by uh, about 27,000 20, cars a day. So we have, the model is predicting some very heavy growth in certain roadways. And probably what, um, one of the things that we pointed out to, to city staff was that because of the amount of employment and residential growth along Southport, um, where, and where it comes to uh, Lake Washington, you're having big growth on two roadways meeting each other there. And this is growth that's occurring both, it's not a directional type of growth, it's really, you have a lot of employment growth and a lot of residential growth. So you have a lot of conflicting movements at that intersection that are both trying to get in and trying to get out during the AM and PM peak period. So that's the main cause for a level of service problem there. So. Let me try to control this one. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, just gonna have to have a hard time scrolling it. John, if I may, the arrows up yeah. there you go. There you go. Top. Okay. So um we talk a lot about level service. It's actually something that people are trying to move away from, but I guess um, uh, I'd like to talk about it as delay. It's really what it is. It's these, these, are, these dots on this map are representing uh, intersection level service. What intersection level service is, is how much, how much time are you waiting at a stoplight? Um, Level service C, you're waiting about 35 seconds on average. That's everybody who passes through it. Now, some people are a lot less than that because they're going in the non-peak direction, and some people are a lot more than that because they're going in the peak direction. When you get all the way up to level service E condition, you're at 80 seconds of average delay for every vehicle that passes through an intersection. Again, some of those people are waiting a lot more than 80 seconds, and some are waiting a lot less. You get in level service F, you start to increase delay very quickly because all of a sudden you get to a point where a lot of people are having to wait more than one traffic light. The number of people who are waiting more than one traffic light goes, goes up real quickly, and once that does, then all of a sudden everybody's waiting an extra minute, minute and a half, depending on how long the signal cycle is. So delay goes up very quickly when you get into level service app. So for some people, they're saying, well, that's, we don't, we're, we're not as concerned as much now than, about, than we used to be about level service and I think that that's a very fair thing to say I think though when you say once you get into level service have conditions you start to get into really bad delay real quickly and so if you told somebody you know my average delay is going to be 90 seconds at an intersection 90 seconds is level service app but it's not very far into level service app and people could say well that's there's a lot of intersections out there today where you would see that but if you told somebody you're going to wait 200 seconds of delay on average at an intersection, which means that some people are waiting, you know, quite a bit more than that, that's a little different. You're well into F. So I think that as we talk about level service, we have to talk about just shades of, of delay and what is, you know, something that affects the community a lot because you have really long delays at certain locations. Yeah, John, I, maybe this is a good time to ask the same question I asked David, because I'm looking on this diagram, and I know this is 2035 baseline, it's not current conditions, mm -hmm. but uh, as somebody who lives close to uh, the I Street Bridge, mm -hmm. and on a daily basis I see, I see PM, uh, major uh, backups out of you know the, the two state buildings that are basically uh, dumping traffic into that location. And it gets distributed, but a lot of it is on I Street, and there's three or four cycles before cars get through those intersections. I just don't understand why there wasn't any identification of an issue uh, in that location. It didn't seem like it was modeled. Uh, 
in, in well, the it's in the model whether it was in the analysis or not. It, it is definitely in the model. Um, I, I'll go back and, and see what kind of data we have at that location. I'm sure we do because of all the, all the analysis being done right now, and we'll get it in. Yeah, because I we'll, saw we'll the second it slide. It had 5,000 right. cars was your daily volume at that location. Right. Uh, and I don't know whether they're assuming the, the realignment of the bridge is going to take care of that or not, but it, it's certainly a problem right now. Okay. Uh, so. All right. Good, good comment, and we'll make sure that, that that's in both the existing conditions as well as the future conditions. Okay. So one of the things you'll see from this is um, we have some red dots on there, where they're half dots. They're actually uh, the, the stuff that's on the left-hand side is the AM. The right-hand side of the colored dots there is the PM peak hours. So you can see whether it's a problem in both the AM or uh, PM or not. And um, we get into some locations here where, um, where we put those little blue dots on that earlier diagram saying that we're going to actually uh, make an improvement at that location to try to get um, a reasonable level of service. And, but there are some locations such as Southport and uh, Lake Washington where um, we can get you um, from being really bad into level service F, but you have to do some things like triple left turn lanes at that location to be able to do that. So it's an at grade improvement, which is typically what we, you know, would be dealing with at, at normal locations. Um, we can't get you even, you know, out of level service F, even with some very significant um, uh, at grade improvements. So uh, there are other intersections here that are closer, you know, up in the Bridge District and closer to the river and, you know, the infamous locations like Jefferson right near the freeway where it's not surprising probably to most people that we're talking about having significant, you know, level service issues at that, even with, even with the assumption that you have a bridge at Broadway. Um, uh, but we're a little bit more concerned about some locations like uh, um, Southport and, and Lake Washington where you're, for economic development reasons, you're trying to build employment down there and so forth, and the congestion levels could be very high in both the AM and PM peak periods, not just one, but both. So, The city does have a level service policy um, in the general plan. Um, the current policy is level service C, except D is acceptable within a quarter mile of freeway interchanges and bridge crossings. Now, you know, the city staff had some discussions with uh, city council over this level service policy. And Right now, we're operating with a general direction on this, which is to allow level service E in selected areas, but for other areas, still keep the level service C with level service D near a uh, quarter mile near, near, uh, within freeway interchanges or bridge crossings. Now, I put together this map. Um, it's uh, got some shaded areas in there, and the orangish shaded area there is the area that uh, staff has talked to the uh, uh, council about allowing level service E conditions, which covers the Washington Bridge District, the uh, um, going down the, the West Capitol Corridor. Um, and then you also see some yellow areas on there where level service D policy is allowed, and that's because they're near freeway interchanges or near the bridges. So um, we've used that in our, we've used both of these in our analysis because, uh, you know, from an uh, analysis standpoint, we have to say that if you stuck with the current uh, level service policy, here would be, you know, the type of effects. If you went to a new level service policy, there would be the type of effects. And 
the conclusions of this are just summarized here that um, even with feasible intersection improvements that we're assuming the analysis, there are 10 intersections that would not meet the current level service policy and nine intersections that would not meet the, the, the new level service policy. So the other thing that we have pointed out is that the level service at, at uh, uh, Lake Washington Southport would be there even if uh, we had major accurate improvements. And we've done some preliminary, we did some preliminary uh, analysis before we came to him on this and said that we knew that the Enterprise Bridge would make a major relief to, to that, uh, that congestion. So the staff then asked us to go back and take a closer look at this, and we've started to um, look at what daily volumes would you would have uh, with the Enterprise Bridge, putting that into the model. So you can see on here uh, a revised uh, set of vo volume. Uh, you can see the Enterprise Bridge uh, off over here. And um, a better way to look at this is to is a diagram like this where everything that's green on this map is where volumes would go down. Everything that's orange and red on this thing are volumes going up uh, compared with and without the Enterprise Bridge. So the Enterprise Bridge, you get obviously get increases over on Enterprise and uh, roads that feed it, and you get decreases on portions of Southport and uh, Industrial and Lake Washington and Harbor. Uh, those decreases are pretty substantial. We're talking about close to 20,000 cars a day shifting from one bridge to another bridge. And um, quite a bit of that coming out of the key intersection that we just talked about. So, and these forecasts were actually, we're actually done with um, narrowing, not having a six lane widening of uh, industrial down across, uh, including its crossing of the ship canal down to Lake Washington. Um, so the key thing, this, this shows the um, assumed roadway improvements, and the key thing to this is that there's not a widening from uh, four lanes to six lanes on uh, the existing bridge across uh, at Industrial, and uh, there's not the dots that are on that map are actually less of an improvement than what would be needed if you uh, didn't have the Enterprise Bridge. So this shows um, some revised levels of service there. Um, at the intersection of uh, Southport and uh, Lake Washington with some reasonable improvements, we can get it down to a level service D. We couldn't get it completely out of level service D conditions, but it's, it was way into F and it's brought all the way down to a D level service during one of the peak hours. Um, you know, the, it, it has some benefits at other locations as well, but that's probably the biggest one um, from a level service standpoint is at that intersection. So the basic conclusions that we had from this was that you reduce the number of improvements needed uh, on Industrial and Lake Washington Boulevard. In fact, we looked at some really order of magnitude cost estimates for this. Um, we've said that um, we're not quite sure exactly what kind of bridge you'd have over, over Enterprise, but we think it's in the order of magnitude of $100 million. That's based upon some of the cost estimates that have been done for some of the other bridges that you're looking at to cross the Sacramento River. We're assuming a lift bridge. But at the same time, by reducing the widening from six lanes to four lanes, including another bridge that needs to be widened, we're th our estimates show that it could be in the range of 35 to $45 million in improvements you would not have to make on other roadways, including intersections and roadway widenings. Um, so while it's a significant cost increase, 
to have the enterprise bridge, it's not as, it's not, it, it does save you on other things. Keeps you from having some six lane roadways, which are, and six lane roadways are not bike and pedestrian and friendly as four lane roadways. So we think that it has some advantages from that standpoint. Um, it does provide another crossing of the ship canal, which would provide more emergency access to Southport, and it, it very much improves uh, truck and goods movement access to Southport in the in industrial plan area. So those are the basic findings of what we have uh, from our analysis. And uh, whether you want to talk about the Enterprise Bridge or just the basic analysis of the general plan, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Long. I'm going to defer to my fellow commissioners for initial comments or questions. Yes. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. It's been really, really helpful and uh, been a quick education for me on, on the local scene. Um, I do have some questions. Um, first of all is, um, were there any cost comparisons done um, of, uh, say, the grade separation or of all alternatives? Um, and, and with cost comparison, including things like, um, you know, productivity losses due to congestion and, and road maintenance, as well as just the construction costs. No, no none of that has been done yet. Okay. Um, and I know we're in the early stages, so I'm yeah, just it, trying to get caught up in my we, own head. We didn't try to put a cost estimate on a intersection grade separation, because you could do it many different ways. It's really kind of a design issue that it's a, it's a location you wouldn't want to typically do a grade separation. So. You, you might have more than one option to do it there if you decided that that was the route you wanted to go instead of, you know, a new ship canal bridge. But you're trying to take several major movements and, you know, get them away from each other. Right. And whether you take it as through movements or left turn flyovers or things like that, any of these things may not be the type of thing you want in your community. Swing it over public, yeah, public it, storage. So if you send some <laughs> engineers at it, they could come up with a series of things that get at just the pure moving traffic and get it to a level service um, improvement. But it may not be what the community wants. That's, yeah, so that's, that's right. it'd be really hard to kind of say what the real cost would be without going through that exercise. Right. Yeah, and that's that's why I would recommend if you if you go down this road when you discuss alternatives or the or the bridge itself that you also provide um, impacts to, uh, to to things like productivity and road maintenance and quality of life um, in addition to just straight cost of construction um, another question is um, have there been any uh, VMT comparison of alternatives I know you've uh, focused a lot on LOS um, but uh, you know as we know too that the kind of Mm -hmm. the, the, infra the policy infrastructure is shifting under our feet now. The Enterprise Bridge lowers the BMT. Lowers the BMT. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, um, you know, what, what uh, potential impacts there are to induce development, both, both good and bad. I know we're constrained, yeah. you know, on three sides, so that's, that's actually right. kind of helpful for us. We don't have the same greenfield, I think, issues that a number of other cities do have, but it's still a question. Not one that we could easily answer on that one. It, there's not a, some some regions have land use models that can get at those things that are interacting between the transportation. There's not one that is here, I suppose. So we're, we're working off of one land use scenario. Okay. Um, last, uh, figure two showed some uh, significant employment gains in Southport. Is that due to moving a lot of industry to uh, Southport or is that? Well, the employment gains come in Southport Business Park, you know, which is still maybe only half developed. Um, then also the Seaway property that's owned by the port that's on the area just between sort of Lowe's and Southport Business Park is several hundred acres of it's completely vacant. Okay. Um, that is, you know, will we'll ultimately develop with additional employment. Um, you know, there certainly would be some increased retail, um, you know, some more schools down there, but it's primarily Southport Business Park and Seaway. Okay. And do we have a, a, an estimation of the the types of jobs, income levels, because um, this will help us determine how to best serve transportation and mobility for the communities, uh, for the em employees who will be accessing it. You know, Seaway is, is sort of in flux, you know, right now because it's, you know, the port owns it. Um, you know, we propose some potential land use changes in there to get some additional, potentially even some housing, but also some re more retail and office from what it's currently planned at. Um, 
when we took that to the Port Commission um, last fall, uh, the Port Commission, you know, at that time didn't really want us to make any changes out there. They wanted to leave primarily the business park and water-related industrial zoning out there, at least for now. Uh, but I would expect that at least maybe the eastern half of that might move to much more of in a mixed-use office retail, you know, direction, you know, long-term. Okay. Um, and, and just a, a general comment on LOS. Um, there are, you know, as we know, impacts to improving vehicle LOS because when you say LOS, you're, the assumption is, is uh, automobile LOS, although it does case, include yeah. some, some bus and, and yeah. freight movement as well. Um, but that those, you know, by improving vehicle LOS, these, um, those impacts can tend to seriously constrain LOS for other modes, in particular pedestrian and, and bicycle modes, um, in addition to putting, you know, pressure on, um, on, on development and the types of development that take place. So I just thought I'd put that out there a little bit. Um, and then uh, last, I, I liked the, the mentioning of uh, emergency services. And I would, I would love and would highly recommend that you include other social equity costs and benefits that would accrue to uh, the project and to alternatives that you also study, um, including uh, criteria pollutant in increases or decreases, because if it reduces VMT, it may or may not reduce criteria pollutants. And the, the, where, the, um, where the road is proposed, you know, there are prevailing winds that move into communities that are immediately adjacent. So, you know, um, studying some impacts to like PM 2.5 and, and PM 10, um, as well as uh, access to jobs and opportunities for the low-income communities, low-income households in, in the region, um, and, and other social equity impacts. I think it would be a, a great, this is a great um, opportunity because it, we're looking at a longer term project. And, uh, you know, if you want to build support, I think it would, it would be really helpful. Yeah, the criteria pollutant analysis will be in the general plan EIR from sort of once we've established what the preferred, you know, growth scenario and, and infrastructure scenario will be. Mm -hmm. so but that's reached, that's citywide, right? Yes. But I just mean for this particular, when we're talking about the enterprise bridge, you, is that what you're referring to as well? Well, get, yeah, I mean, just, you know, we'll, out? yeah, we will do those kind of analyses, uh, you know, for sure. But, you know, we want to build, and you know, we want to help build the case that the enterprise bridge, I mean, it, it seems, you know, empirically it seems like, you know, you would, it makes perfect sense to do it, but we do want to have that backup of the VMT. And you know, we we did just a quick Google map, and you know, with the Enterprise Bridge, if you're just trying to get to the freeway, it's only about a mile shorter. But I think, as as John mentioned, if you have 20,000 cars driving one less mile, that adds up. That's right. And so, and VMT is the name of the game. Yeah. You know, these days. Right. I, I understand that, um, and and that's what I would anticipate as well. I just wanted to flag the potential for freight movement through there to actually increase localized criteria pollutants, which has a you know, real serious detrimental health impact on the community. Especially considering that there are a couple of uh, designated disadvantaged communities per the Cal Enviro screen that are immediately adjacent to this, this facility or this, this proposal. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the commission? Uh, I have a more of a big picture question about the modeling itself. Is this a, I, you mentioned it's part of the SACOG regional transportation modeling effort. So in a case where you have the rail yards development uh, on the east side of the river, which is going to add about 12,000, potentially 12,000 housing units, is that fully factored in to the, the traffic analysis within the city of West Sacramento, the, the patterns? of uh, distribution of, of commuting from that location and with these new bridge locations, how, how do those factor in? Well, all of the growth that's um, in the region is in the mall. Uh, but that, is it fully factored in? Probably not because it's a 2035 analysis. Um, we're, we were given uh, the working version that, uh, of land use that SACOG is using for their new Metropolitan Transportation Plan, SCS. Um, so it, it may change a little bit before they actually adopt it, but it was the latest and greatest that they could give to us. Uh, the city requests they do that. So there is a substantial amount of growth in the rail yards in there. 
I don't think it's full build out of, of that, but it's their estimate of what growth could occur by 2035, so it's a substantial portion of it. So that's about, I, you know, I don't think they have the full 12,000 dwelling units, is what I'm kind of trying to say. I think it's something less than that. Um, I think Josh out of, asked all the great technical questions. What I'm going to ask now, question, uh, the question that I'm going to ask right now is more on the economic side. So first of all, um, you mentioned it's, about, it's going to cost over $100 million for that bridge. We don't really, we, we're doing, we call this order of magnitude. We're just saying that it could cost in the range of $100 million okay, so for that type of a bridge. Are we also going to apply for grants to pay for this project? Let me go ahead and, and <laughs> jump okay. in here. Um, okay. the, the magnitude of the cost that we were looking at was representative of some of the work that we're doing for uh, right now, the I Street Bridge Replacement Project, as well as the Broadway Bridge Project. Uh, both of those bridges being vertical lift bridges, we're looking around 120, 100, or 100 to $125 million for uh, a movable bridge. Uh, of that size and scale. Uh, if look, you're looking at the channel, uh, you're looking at the navigational uh, clearance for a bridge, you're looking at a similar style bridge. Now whether or not it would be a movable bridge or if we do something that is uh, less um, uh, pedestrian scaled, for instance, and, and something where we you know, do a flyover like Lake Washington, then uh, you know, the cost could also change as well as the uh, ongoing uh, operations and maintenance costs as well. Uh, for this exercise, for the purpose of reviewing the uh, Enterprise Bridge as uh, something that would be feasible uh, and would have an impact on the traffic analysis itself, as far as the economics go, we did not delve deeply into the economics because this is uh, more of a traffic exercise uh, purely. Uh, as far as the cost goes, we threw out the number of 100 to $125 million is you know, something that we're looking at right now for two of our bridges of similar size and scale. So do we plan to apply for grants to pay for the bridge? Uh, currently, we have uh, funding for uh, Broadway Bridge uh, to the tune of $1.5 million for, uh, the, uh, engi for the environmental and the preliminary engineering. Uh, that would be the PA and ED phase. Uh, we are working with FHWA on a grant agreement for that, uh, but the grant has been awarded to West Sacramento. Uh, that does not mean that we have funding sources already identified for uh, subsequent phases. So um, right now, feasibility study at a half a million dollars and then uh, the next phase at 1.5. Uh, so there is significant amount of investment that's still going to have to, uh, you know, sources of funding be identified for those. Uh, that would be the same for Enterprise Bridge as well. I see. The reason I ask is because, you know, when we have multiple projects going on, we want to prioritize. We are thinking about uh, what we are giving up, the opportunity cost we are, we are suffering, right? So we, given the traffic condition, we can, uh, we can definitely see with this new bridge, it's going to relieve the traffic. But also, I, I sort of echo um, Josh's concern about, because remember when I, was sit, when I sit on the EDAC commission, uh, they mentioned something about the port is not, they basically outsourced the management of the port and they're not doing anything about it. So I'm just wondering, uh, are we sure we're definitely gonna create a lot of, you know, jobs and, you know, traffic along that area? And is it definitely gonna help a lot in terms of, you know, relieving the, the traffic jams? If I could, let me, uh -huh. as, as far as the, the port goes, I, I can't speak to that, but I do wanna speak to the fact that uh, we are looking very far ahead here. Uh, Planning for Broadway Bridge and for the I Street Bridge replacement has been ongoing for a very long time. Uh, just to put it in perspective, the I Street Bridge itself, we're looking at uh, construction to uh, start around 2018, complete around 2018, 2020. Uh, we're looking at Broadway Bridge uh, to be online sometime, uh, hopefully before 2030, between 2025 and 2030, you would be looking at this bridge around the 2035 uh, timeline. So what, what we're talking about here is advanced planning uh, for a major infrastructure project uh, in the future. 
So uh, can I have one more have sure. one more question? So if it's advanced planning, I would really uh, hope that you guys could coordinate with the port just to make sure that the bridge, for example, the type of bridge you are building, maybe you will need a movable bridge in the, in the case of, in the future we might deepen in the canal and we have, you know, bigger, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't want to build a bridge and then say, oh, too bad, we, we need to replace it. We need to increase the height. You don't want to run into issues like that. <laughs> Well, I, I will say that uh, a lot of the the reasoning with the behind the movable bridge is uh, for the instance of the Sacramento River, uh, should there be a levee breach, the easiest way to repair a levee breach in an emergency situation would be to take a barge uh, to the location of the breach and and dump a lot of debris in that area, uh, rip wrap to to stop the uh, the breach. Uh, a lot of the design aspects, uh, including bridge types. Uh, navigational clearances are all dictated by the Coast Guard. So uh, being a navigational channel, uh, the type of bridge, the location, the span, a lot of it would be dictated through coordination that we would have with uh, the Coast Guard as well as, as with uh, other federal agencies. Thank yeah, you. For, for, for tonight's purpose, I want to encourage the Commission to, you know, not to be too concerned about what type of bridge, you know, it would be, you know, at this stage. What we're what we're ultimately seeking tonight is, you know, your recommendation that we actually start to consider the Enterprise Bridge, you know, seriously. There'll be, have to be a lot of work to evaluate its feasibility going forward, costs. Uh, and, but, you know, we recognize that if we, we do think we will need this bridge, you know, by, say, 2035 or later, uh, we can't wait till 2030 to start planning for it. You know, we need to start planning for it now. Uh, identifying the funding sources, potentially getting some of it into our traffic impact fee program. Uh, and, you know, eventually it may come where we decide, you know what, it's just not workable in, you know, in the end. But we want to start those efforts now, so we're seeking your guidance on that because at this very high level and preliminary level, it does seem to afford us potentially a lot of benefits and you know, avoiding many other improvements that are probably less than desirable amongst themselves. And you know, one of the factors we haven't even talked about here is part of this is that the way under the current scheme, the way enterprise bull, enterprise gets, excuse me, industrial boulevard gets widened, it actually necessitates creating a whole new intersection and entrance to the port. It blows right through the city fire station that's right there at the corner. And even though we, we may want to relocate that station for for other reasons, and uh, it, it just has a whole sort of cascading effects. You know, if we if we don't seriously consider doing the enterprise bridge so we want to be able to move you know this is still very baby steps but we want to be able to start moving there and we're hoping that you're will recommend to the council direct us to start move, make doing those baby steps I mean I could add to that in that um, you have the widening to six lanes of the of industrial and, and the Lake Washington Bridge in your impact fees program right now that's actually where I went to get costs to say what would be the, you know, the benefit of not having to do that. So if you decide that this is what you want to have in, your, in the general plan by 2035 and decide that that's what you want to put into your fee program, then effectively you have the ability to transfer some of those funds to, to enter, Enterprise. Not that Enterprise Bridge is going to be fully funded by a fee program, but you really are trading costs off. And if you have a policy direction that that's the way you want to go, then you can start doing the planning now to kind of have this, um, get funding in place, go after grants, and start, uh, you know, and the way I look at it is I think that there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of things that you uh, can do um, multimodal-wise in both locations if you don't concentrate it all in one location where you're trying to get six, you know, a very heavily traveled six-lane roadway cut it down to f a much easier tr uh, travel four-lane roadway, you got more opportunities there for, for multimodal uses. And the same thing could be said at Enterprise. So I just think it has, has a lot of benefits, potential for it. Any other comments from the commissioner? I think we've uh, heard some very compelling reasons, at least in my opinion. One of the main reasons I moved to West Sacramento and why I enjoy living here so much is our ability to to navigate not only the city but also throughout the region. So I think we've heard some compelling reasons as to why we might think it's a prudent idea to recommend to the council to move forward. So I, I think. So
Okay, motion. Uh, thank you. Second. Commissioner Stark and Commissioner Zhu, thank you. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or discussion? Great, thank you. Motion passes. And I actually don't have a copy of the agenda. I think there is one, is there one more item on the agenda? No, I believe that uh, concludes Thank you. Uh, the calendar. We just are looking for a motion to adjourn at this point. Uh, I think normally we, I, I, one more request from other commissions I served on. I think we, I'd like to request maybe we could at some point here an update or maybe brief this commission since the new commission on, on the trolley car routing issue discussion that's currently ongoing. I know it might be out of order of how things are going, but just so that this commission is aware of, of that, those discussions that are occurring at this time. I think that's very much within the, the realm of this commission, uh, as well as updates on uh, the bridges themselves. Um, there are a number of, of steps that are being taken right now to uh, move projects through. So as uh, projects advance, we'll be bringing those uh, updates to the commission on a regular basis. Um, I'd also like to recommend, and that sounds kind of silly, but I'll say it anyway, um, that the commission conduct um, field reviews or field trips, whatever you want to call it, um, to the different parts of the city that, are, that we're going to be addressing or parts that um, staff thinks are relevant um, and important for us to, to experience. If there's anything in particular that the commission is interested in, uh, anything uh, that you'd, you'd like to see, we can always schedule that out. Uh, just uh, go ahead and either provide that in comments uh, today or uh, you know, send an email. We can always uh, agendize an item and, and then uh, schedule something out. Great. Without hearing anything further, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Motion adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>